Welcome to Yucatastrophe.com. This is our uh, interview for the month of August, and we have a special guest today, uh, an unusual guest. It's my good friend, John Pletcher, and my colleague here at Yucatastrophe.com. And this is a reader interview. So instead of actually interviewing someone who wrote the book, we're going to interview someone who's read the book. And that's my, my good friend, John. So, um, John, thanks for uh, joining me today. Glad to. So fun, the, the fun book, to interact. The, yeah, it will be fun. The book that uh, we're going to spend a little time talking about is John Garth's book, The Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, The Places That Inspired Middle Earth, which we both got a copy of earlier this summer. And uh, spent time soaking it in. And uh, so I, I have the privilege of kind of getting some of John's thoughts about this uh, really um, uh, beautiful book and uh, has some great insights that I think every fan of J.R.R. Tolkien will, will benefit from. Yeah, hold that up there. The it is a beautiful of, book. It's, it, it is. It's beautiful, yeah. It, it is coffee table. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah yes. it is. Yep. So we're going to spend a little time uh, getting his uh, thoughts on uh, several parts of, of the book. So, John, thanks for uh, being with us today for yep. August. Glad to. Yep. All right. So let's jump right in. Um, what did you, John, what did you find uh, personally the most unique and helpful about John Garth's uh, approach in this particular book? So... Uh, no bones about it. We, we've already said uh, beautiful resource. It, it's a brilliant book. Um, numerous features, very praiseworthy. Um, no doubt about that. And I'm going to, to spotlight a number of those praiseworthy features with great enthusiasm. But let me get just a couple of nitpicky critiques out of the way. Uh, okay. Um, I think most of our viewers will appreciate the fact that whenever we interact with a resource, there are things you like, there are things you don't like. Um, and there are a couple of things that I don't completely uh, appreciate in the book. And I, but I'd rather say those right up front, call them out, uh, get them out of the way. Uh, first, there are ways, honestly, that I find it to be a confusing book at points. Um, at points kind of challenging to follow. Um, it's sort of organized around, sort of organized <laughs> around 11 different sections, 11 different sections, but I'm really not sure at, at a number of points why or what Garth's rationale is for the sequence. I, I, I just got to be honest about that. There's points where I'm like, I, what, what, why? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, with each section, there's a good bit of overlap of details that are shared, which makes things confusing at points. So there are uh, profuse comments in parentheses constantly throughout the book, uh, parenthetical comments, constantly referencing what he covers in other sections, parentheses, back and forth. And for me personally, that feels dizzying and annoying. Um, I realize um, that that might not have been his choice. That may have been uh, an editorial choice or something, but from a user vantage point, that, that feels confusing and annoying. Um, Second, from a layout vantage point, many of the breakout boxes and maps have tiny font that is really difficult to read. And yes, I have progressive lenses. And yes, I have help in my contacts. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, and it's still, it, it, it's still challenging. It really is. Um, there are several spots where things just feel kind of disjointed or incomplete even in the editing process and this is Princeton University Press <clears throat> uh, uh, 
thank you, Princeton University Press, for doing such a rich resource. There's a couple spots where just, I'm not sure what happened, but those are my dings. Those, those are my things right up front. Swipe those aside. Uh, let, let me affirm you first. Affirm okay, your, okay. <laughs> so I, I felt, I was telling you yesterday, I kind of felt the same, yeah. the same way. Um, I wasn't always sure what he was trying to communicate with the particular items of mm -hmm. Tolkien's um, uh, world that, uh, so I, uh, yeah, at times it was difficult to, for me to track. Yeah. Um, yeah. But overall, it's a beautiful, oh, it is. I mean, there's, it's, there's, there's, yeah. it's a treasure. It's yeah. a treasure yeah. Yeah. full of all kinds of yeah, absolutely. Um, things to mind. Absolutely. So, um, you, you know, if, if you're out there in Princeton's world or, um, uh, John Garth yourself, if you're if you're catching this, please hear our thank you for this resource, uh, loud and clear. Um, hey, flip flip through a few pages for people to see on the screen because there's some beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you 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 yeah. capture some amazing some amazing stuff. Now, let me tell you, uh, let let me tell you what helped me on this. So, setting aside those personal drawbacks, I found it helpful to think of this book like a set of uh, 11 shiny buckets. Uh, buckets, uh, categories in which Garth collects rich gems from all mm -hmm. over Middle Earth. Um, and, and many of those gems he deems interchangeable between the 11 buckets. But it's okay to just sort of go and dip in and out of the different buckets. And, and by the way, the, the gems, the rich gems, are allowed to sort of rumble around mm -hmm. among other things in each bucket, and that's okay. So thinking about this resource that way really helped me. The buckets aren't really necessarily meant to line up in a rational sequence. That helps me a lot to think about it that way. In other words, it really is wonderful to just plop it open and enjoy Garth's insight and pictures wherever and whenever. That's cool. Um, you, you mentioned coffee table resource. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I, I think is really cool about it is that he, I think he wanted it to be that and wanted it to be highly scholarly at the same time. Um, beautiful coffee table resource and highly scholarly at the same time. Uh, hence my analogy of the silver buckets, rich gems, and sometimes you can mix and match in, in between there. Now, what I really love and I find unique, you asked me that the lead off question was what's, what's unique about this resource. I find very unique his multifaceted approach in explaining the potential genesis of Middle Earth's lands and features. Multifaceted approach. Mm -hmm. uh, he does not just link to places out there, but also Tolkien's own erudite reading. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas many scholars and fans across the years have conjectured, uh, with good conjecture, with fun conjecture at points, but they've conjectured about the inspiration for mm -hmm. Tolkien's lands and special features. Garth presents places and inspirations based on his scholarship of Tolkien's own history based on primary sources. So primary it's a great, sources. it's a great fact, um, fact finding, fact check, fact checking resource. Yeah, yeah, this is not, this is not somebody else's, Garth is not presenting fake news. <laughs> related to Tolkien. He's not saying um, all theories are created equal. It's not yeah. even an exposition of a bunch of different theories. Once in a while, he sprinkles something in that it's way out left field and he'll say, this has been said, but it's grossly underestimated or overstated. Yeah. This is, this is, this has gravitas to it based on Tolkien's own primary sources, what he actually said. And then any place Garth goes after conjecture, he says so. 
Yeah. He says this is conjecture. So I find that super helpful. Um, especially considering uh, Garth's presenting of what Tolkien had read, his own research, deep, deep, deep ancient literature. And he mm -hmm. pulls that in, the influence of ancient literature, as well as, and in a few minutes, uh, I'll talk about a few of the examples, but as well as the places he visited, uh, as well as his own journeys, his own adventures, uh, his own journeys with fellowships of people and stuff like that. 